this video is quite useless. Go home. Thanks for wasting my time. Who is right and who is wrong? And I'm not gonna lie, at first I had read that comment and I was like, man, I think, I think they're right. I have our 15.5 part that I previously machined. Before I give it to Jesse at the fifth axis, I wanted to go ahead and check some features. One of those features I checked was the flatness. Who is right and who is wrong? This was definitely probably the most contentious video I did with people in both camps, and that video is the flatness video, the manual check, the old school way of checking flatness, and y'all definitely had some opinions. Now, the intent of this video was to, again, just show manual flatness, either as a confirmation of a CMM reading, or if you didn't have a CMM, this is the way you could go about it. Now, the comments were pretty strong in both regards, but we'll address the comments that basically said we weren't checking flatness. In fact, we have a couple, you are not measuring flatness, you are measuring parallelism. You're checking parallelism, not flatness, just straight up. So there was definitely a heavy leaning on one side that we were not checking flatness and we were only checking parallelism. So the question is, what were we really checking? And that we're gonna go ahead and get into now. I think where we wanna start is with talking about what is flatness and what is parallelism. Now, I don't actually want this to be a huge in-depth video on gd &T, but real quick, flatness is basically checking a surface to itself. So imagine you have a surface and it's in theory flat, but no surface is really perfectly flat. So you're gonna have these bumps and valleys, mountains and valleys, right? And so flatness is looking at really the height of those mountains and the low of those valleys, and that distance between the highest and the lowest of that surface right there, that's flatness. Now parallelism differs a little bit in that it takes that surface and it compares it to another surface. So when you see a parallelism call out, you'll always see parallel to a datum A or a datum C or some sort of datum. It is a surface related to itself. So if you have two surfaces, and let's say you have this bottom surface and you have a top surface, the way that angles and how that surface relates to this one, that is essentially parallelism. Now, our test used three jacks. If you saw the video, you probably remember these jacks. Now, something I wanna talk about, and I think this is probably where some of the confusion came in, is there is a difference between fixed jacks and movable jacks or adjustable jacks. Now, we used adjustable jacks, which allow us to basically screw and move our jacks up and down. Now there is another set of jacks that you can use that are fixed jacks. And I think this is probably where some of the confusion came from. Now, one way to check flatness and one that you definitely mentioned is you can use three fixed jacks. Now if it's fixed, basically they're precision jacks. And it means that the height from the granite to the top of the jack is exactly the same for all three jacks. All three jacks are exactly the same height, exactly the same distance from the granite to the point. So, believe it or not, this was actually the original part we checked, but you can see down here it has fins cut in it now, so I'm not gonna be able to set it on top. But if I was to set this part before it had these fins cut on these jacks and they were fixed jacks, then what I would do is I would create a plane with those jacks. If you can imagine the surface of that part, you now have one jack, two jack, three jack, and they're all on the same point. So then I could take my indicator and I could go underneath the part and I could scan that surface for variations against that plane that I created with the fixed jacks. You have the fixed jacks, I'm either gonna measure high or I'm gonna measure low, and that total indicator run out, that is my flatness. That is a way to check flatness, but I think the confusion set in, it's not the only way to check flatness. Now, if I was to use those fixed jacks and do what I did in the video, which is check the top of the part, that would be checking parallelism, because essentially, I have the part sitting on a plane, right? I'm mimicking that bottom plane with those jacks, and I'm checking the deviation of this plane, with the indicator, to this plane created with the fixed jacks. But I didn't use fixed jacks. I used adjustable jacks. What I did is I stuck this part on here and I used these adjustable jacks essentially to take what I was doing or what I would do with fixed jacks, three points, and transfer them up to the top of the part. By adjusting these jacks and making sure that I use my indicator to read zero directly above these jacks, essentially I'm taking that fixed jack sort of state and I'm transferring it to the top of the part. So I no longer have a plane down here that I'm referencing. I have this part 
sitting up top and I'm creating three points just like I would with the lower fixed jacks but now they're up top. I have three points that are again the exact same distance from that point to the granite here, here, and here. So now I have three points exactly the same height from the granite just like the fixed jacks three points exactly the same height from the granite to test the gifts. The difference is I don't have to get underneath the part because getting underneath the part is tricky. It's hard. You can miss some spots. You just, the, you don't, I don't think you have the full sweep range that you do when you transfer it to the top. Have the top part. I have one, two, three points, same height. That's my plane. Now I can move all around this part. And again, if you imagine the surface, I have three points, exact same height, and I have that difference from highest to lowest, that is flatness. So I think what happened is there was a confusion on the adjustable jacks and what they're actually doing. The adjustable jacks allow you to take a fixed jack-like condition and transfer it to the top of the part, thereby freeing you from the obstruction down here. The reality is, is that we were checking flatness. It's not the only way to check flatness, but it was very much a viable, and in my opinion, personally, the better way to check flatness for a manual check. But again, that's just my preference, and I have this feeling that there's almost still gonna be some disagreement in the comments below. But go ahead and let us know if that cleared that up for you, and if that's a little more, if that makes sense, please let us know in the comments below. first video, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take you back probably about four years. In fact, this video was made right before we started packing up the shop in California and getting ready to head out here in Texas. And this was the 800 holes video on our old Puma 2600. The point of this video was to drill as many holes as possible. In fact, what you don't know is the original part that I wanted to design, I wanted to do a thousand holes because that would take us to four digits and that was cool. But it turned out that when everything got set up and with the material I had, I could only do 800 holes. So we got an 800 hole video. But nonetheless, we wanted to see if a small 3 16 drill would last in 3 16 stainless for 800 holes. So that was the original intent of the video and off we were about filming it. And I thought it went pretty well, but there was one comment that stuck out. In fact, it was the most popular comment on that video. And it simply said, I would drill them in Z axis in a row and then turn the C axis, much less C axis turning and would be faster. In fact, I think one of the comments even mentioned that it would save like 30% cycle time. And I'm not going to lie. At first I had read that comment and I was like, man, I think, I think they're right. I agreed with that comment. Cause in the video I had rotated the part. I would drill a hole, rotate, drill a hole, rotate, drill a hole, rotate. And then I would step forward in Z and do that whole process again. And what they were saying is that I should have drilled all the way from the back, all the way to the front of the part and then drilled that way. So I drill my holes in Z and rotate one time. And so intuitively I thought, oh man, that makes a lot of sense. I think he's right. I think I made a big mistake. And so for a long time, I thought I made a big mistake on that video. But what I've learned in machining and manufacturing is that what you think usually should be verified by some sort of data. And so what I did is I went back to Mastercam, I had that program, and I was actually able to sort of analyze the difference in the tool pass. So really from a time standpoint, I don't think there's really too much of a difference in which way you go about it. Maybe if you were making 10 million holes, it might be something to consider. But for this application, I think for most application, probably not that big of a deal, but there are other things to consider. If I drill all the holes in C and I go forward, I'm changing the structure of that part as I go, as opposed to drilling them down in Z. I'm essentially making the part weaker in some parts as to other parts. And so there is the question of, is there maybe a way to keep the part more rigid when you machine it? And that I think actually, that is true. I think there is a point to be made here, but honestly, I don't think that it's any of the ways we've talked about now. In fact, another person had mentioned that they would start from the front still spin in the C axis and then move back. And honestly, I do think that this is the ideal way because then you maintain material behind the holes that you're machining closer to your chuck, which I do think will provide for a more rigid surface. If you machine all those holes, in a straight line and then you index and you machine in a straight line and then you index and you machine in a straight line. The problem becomes what hole do you inspect to make sure that your drill maintain tolerance throughout the machining process. That is when you get it off there's going to be one row 
in Z that was the final row of machined holes, and that's the row you're gonna wanna check. The problem is there's really gonna be no way to clearly and cleanly identify what row that is. If you machine it in a circle, that is if you go in the front or to the back, or even the original way that we did it from the back to the front, you very distinctly know the last set of features that was machined. It's either the front circle or the rear circle. That allows you to much more accurately check the final holes that were machined on that part. All right, so what is the final consensus on this video addressing the comment of efficiency? I think ultimately that the machining pattern of the holes was correct. We do want to do the C-axis holes all first and then move in Z. I think that was the right way to do it, really for the inspection reason. I do think though that we should start from the front of the part and move towards the back of the part for rigidity reasons. And finally, I think we could have definitely, if we did want to save time, we could reduce that starting height of the drill. And then this would be a optimal approach for this part and this video. As you, can, as you can hear, that sounds terrible. So this brings us to one of my more popular videos, how to remove chatter. But popular doesn't always necessarily mean well received. And you guys in the comments, you definitely let me know how you received that video. And it wasn't always, let's just be real, it wasn't always the nicest. Uh, a lot of the comments were surrounding, well, well here, you know what, let's just read you some of the comments. Uh, first comment here, I got changed way too many parameters to even count this as a real test. Thanks for wasting my time. Oh, the kid one. Boo. The test is invalid if you change multiple variables like the speed and feed. There's no telling if it was the speed and feed rate that changed the results or the insert in the bar, go home. And let's see, I'm sorry to say, but this video is quite useless. The first takeaway is buy a more expensive boring bar because it will make better parts. This is quite obvious and not worth a 15 minute video. Now, while those comments really kind of struck right to the heart of, uh, of me, the creator, I can see where they're coming from. And I will say that I think there was some good in this video, but there is definitely some things that we could have done better. So let's kind of go through those. So going to the intention of this video, what we intended to do was show you ways to reduce chatter, but only in a very specific way. I noticed some of the comments mentioned we didn't really talk about other ways we could have fixed chatter, but we did mention that up front that we were only going to focus on bars and nose radius of our insert. And that's because chatter was a big problem and we we're only teaching you a sliver. Now, that being said though, our intentions don't always pan out the way we wanted to. Now, we wanted to fix certain parameters to isolate, again, that bar and that nose radius. And in some sense, we, we did that a little bit. We fixed the bar length, but that was pretty easy because we had to have the bar length at a fixed location because we had to be able to bore out that part. Now, it is worth mentioning that bar stick out does matter. So if you are trying to reduce chatter and you can shrink your bar up, that is always the first place you should go. But again, we kept that fixed but that was the easy part a lot of the comments talked about we reduced the speed and that obviously altered the results and this is true speed very much will help you with your chatter the problem is the very first speed we used was close somewhere around 750 SFM that was way too fast for the test so I had to reduce that by quite a bit that being said we probably should have found a lower speed that would have worked for all the tests and we should have maintained it throughout so that was really kind of my bad the second parameter that we wanted to fix, and we mentioned this up front, was the depth of cut. Again here though, in our efforts to reduce the chatter, we ended up altering that from a 30 thou to I believe a 20 thou in some of the cuts. Now, making for a smaller depth of cut combined with a nose radius change on your insert is a good way to reduce chatter, but again, I'm gonna go back, that wasn't really the intention of the video. Should have kept that feed rate at .030, and you were right to call me out on it. Now the last parameter that we fixed, although we didn't keep the same across all the parts, was the feed rate. And to be honest, this is the one that I changed that I really kind of regret. If you remember correctly, the way we were judging chatter or measuring how much chatter we had was with the RA or the surface finish of our part. Well, in order to do that, we have to have a sort of a theoretical value that we would get if everything was running good. And for us, that is determined by the feed rate. So we had different feed rates for each nose radius, but they stayed the same all the way through for that specific insert. That being said, I believe on the second to last test with my carbide bar and my 0.0156 insert, I changed that feed in order to get the surface finish I required. And this again, really was a mistake. I conflated what I was trying to achieve, which was really a scientific analysis of bar material and nose radius um, of my carbide insert 
with wanting to get a 32 surface finish. And that was a mistake. I should have ran that feed rate again exactly the same to be more consistent in providing values that help us determine, again, what does the bar do? What does the nose do?